everybody, welcome. I am so excited to be able to introduce our speaker this evening for our Manzanita Speaker Series. Um, Misha Golfman uh, flew out very recently, I think as early as yesterday or today, I think yesterday, from New Hampshire. And uh, he's the founder and director of Croca Expeditions. It's an amazing expeditionary learning school that runs programs all year, including a semester-long program in the northeastern United States that goes into Canada and also a program in Ecuador that's a semester-long as well. And um, I was um, introduced to... Misha and his work through an amazing documentary um, that I showed at the school I used to work at where I was principal called Mother Nature's Child. And it, this documentary covers, uh, th profiles the impacts of nature in different age levels. And it's very sequential, chronological, developmental. And the very end of the documentary looks at the impacts of deep nature immersion, nature connection on on youth at the uh, middle to late adolescent stage. And to do that, they profiled Croca expeditions. And um, the other little personal anecdote to that is that my daughter, Isla, who's now a senior at Manzanita, watched that documentary uh, two years ago. And she watched that clip and she said, I'm going there. Where is she? There she is. And it was not, I get emotional just thinking of it because it was, it was not any ambiguity. It was, I'm going there. And she applied entirely on her own, and she did the interview, and she ended up going. And she did this five-month expedition, and she wrote me a letter saying, Dad, I really think we need to consider some more expeditionary components at Manzanita. And I was in a canoe with the director of Croca, Misha, and I told him that I really wanted his help with that, and he said he would come out and help us. So... Misha came out to help us with our expeditionary learning and also to share with you a little bit about the work he does. So I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for this evening, um, Misha Golfman. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm really honored. And, uh, you know, I enjoy talking to people when we sit around the fire after a hard day of, um, <clears throat> of uh, moving on the trail. And uh, I struggle to be in this kind of environment where I am here and you're all there. Like I was thinking, ah, can I have them, everybody sit in a circle? That I do quite a lot. And, but I understand that it needs to be video, so I will do my very best. <clears throat> but I will ask you some questions as we go along. So I grew up in... Soviet Union, and I was born in 1966. I lived in the sixth floor of a 140 apartment building in apartment number 80 with my sister, my cousins, my grandmother, and my parents. And when I would fall asleep in the corner, little corner of the room with the uh, uh, bookcase separating my corner of the room from other corners of the room where other activities were going on the shadows would move around the walls the shadows from the trains that would arrive to a large train station nearby the big train station I could hear the announcement the train number 65 from Vladivostok is arriving to platform number six and I would imagine what it's like to come off this train from Vladivostok and just a little bit further, there was a seaport. <clears throat> and I could hear all the announcements from the seaport. So going to bed, I would look at the shadows on the wall. I would listen to all of these announcements. And I would dream of going places. <clears throat> and my sister would sit on the other side of the bookcase. She was quite a bit older. And she would do her homework. And she would tell me to shut up and go to bed and go to sleep. And <clears throat> the house where we lived in was facing Moskovsky Prospect, which was the big street connecting city with the airport. And the house formed the courtyard on two sides. On the third side, there was a brick wall. Behind the brick wall, there was a nuclear research laboratory. We didn't know that at the time. We had only learned about it after, <coughs> after I grew up, that there was a we had radiation <clears throat> there. Maybe this has something to do with my excitement for <clears throat> expeditionary life outside of the city. <clears throat> and uh, 
and on the last side there was a row of car garages now for the house of 140 apartments which would generate gosh I don't know a lot of people <clears throat> it was quite stuffed up we had seven cars so seven cars and they were all garaged because people really cherished that it was a <clears throat> Uh, important possession. So if you climbed over the garages, which we did all the time as kids, we would arrive to the land of railroad tracks and abandoned um, nature, which was our wilderness where we played. <clears throat> we also oftentimes would break the lock into the basement of the house and from there we always were on the search of um, the maze of uh, tunnels that it was said connected the whole city underneath. So we were always in the search of those tunnels. And if we go up above all the apartments and break the lock into the attic, we could connect to the long row of attics connecting the whole long building. So I'm painting to you this landscape, the adventure landscape that was surrounding <coughs> uh, at a time, of course, when, uh, well, all the parents worked and you'd come home from school and you'd do whatever until it got dark and then <clears throat> somebody would yell out the window for dinner or not. Um, all the little stores were facing the main street. The meat store, the fish store, the different grocery stores. And in the yard, they kept their boxes. Now this was the time before cardboard boxes. All the boxes were, were wooden. And those wooden boxes were fantastic fuel for making fires and roasting potatoes, <clears throat> and uh, which we did on a regular basis. And all those store people, of course, got so annoyed with us because they were responsible for returning those boxes. <clears throat> and that once in a while, they would they would they would get together and try to round us up <clears throat> and to turn us in. And at that time, we had to flee. And I was a little boy. I was the youngest of the bunch and I was wearing my sister's baggy pants, my older sister's baggy pants, and when we started running away from, um, from that roundup, I could barely keep up, and so my friends were just dragging me along, and uh, they, were, they were catching up to us, and there was a certain fence with the spikes that it was like a last obstacle. We had to clear that fence, and so <clears throat> my friends hoisted me up the fence. They went over, jumped on the other side. I jumped off, and I got hung on the spike by the, by the back pocket of my pants, and I was hanging there, <laughs> kind of swinging around, and I look, my friends are running. They can't see it, and I look back, and here is this huge monsters looking man approaching and just as this big hairy hand is shooting up to reach me two of my brave little friends from the other side they jump on me they hang on me and my pants rip and boom <laughs> down we go <clears throat> and uh yeah that was the this was the adventure landscape of my childhood along with the a uh, large cemetery, pre-revolutionary cemetery, and the cathedral, since religion was prohibited in Soviet Union, cathedral stayed empty. You know, a cathedral is an amazing place to explore. If it's abandoned and empty, it's so scary. It's, it's really cool. And, and then in addition to this, uh, what was really working well for me is that uh, the centralized food distribution system in Soviet Union really didn't work. So in the summertime, when you are to feed your kids now, it's hard for you in California to, to get that probably, but you know, in, in the 60th parallel in Soviet Union, <clears throat> there's very short summer, and that's when you gotta keep feed your kids greens, right? That's like the only time of year you can give them vitamins, <clears throat> but unfortunately there was none in the city. The, it was not a thing of green, because the food distribution system didn't work. So people who could, they would get their kids out into the country and they would rent something on the farm, like a cottage, and and feed their kids well. <clears throat> now, it, what worked really well for me is that my parents didn't have means to rent a cottage in the country. And so what my parents figured out from early age of us kids is that they would <clears throat> take us on long wilderness expeditions because that was free. <laughs> it was free because all we needed is uh, was a uh, folding, folding tandem canvas kayak that would float down the rivers. <clears throat> and we would float on the tandem kayak down the rivers and in the roadless country all the villages are set along the waterways because that's the way to go and so you'd stop at every village and you'd ask for work and you'd ask for work in exchange for food and so that's how from early age I've gotten 
to know how to work in the garden and exchange, get some milk and some cheese, and, uh, and, and it was really awesome. It was a great, great adventure, and we would barter a lot. And I remember that oftentimes what the adults would barter was something like grain alcohol that they would steal at the chemical laboratory at work, and they would bring it in small containers, and that was a very valuable thing of barter. <coughs> And how did we go on those expeditions was really fascinating. So in September, usually, my mom would write a little note on a piece of paper saying a family of four would like to join a paddling expedition in July. She would take that note, <coughs> go to the uh, outdoor club, Central Outdoor Club in downtown Leningrad, and pin it on the wall with many, many other notes. <coughs> and somebody would call and say, would you like to join our group? <coughs> And we would go to some unknown people's house sometime in October and meet people and the group would be formed. And next July we would be going out for a whole month with a group of people who we barely knew. But what happened, the important thing is what happened between that September and July. Because what, what happened is <clears throat> nothing was available. In, in, uh, that was a beautiful thing. Now, now looking back at this, I think that was a really awesome thing. You couldn't go to the store and buy a backpack or dehydrated food or anything like that. Everything had to be made. A map had to be made. A map had to be copied from some government official's office behind the curtains. You had to come with paper at night and copy the map. <coughs> and everything had to be made. And uh, the awesome thing was that was in the, in the 70s that Soviet Union was very self-sufficient in producing everything it needed since the Iron Curtain Kids may not know what Iron Curtain was, adults probably still remember. It made it so there was everything in the country was domestically made. Now things were not, they were not necessarily well made. They might not have been most uh, efficient things. But for us, for kids, it meant that I could go to the shop <coughs> and make a buckle for my backpack. I could go to a woodworking shop and make a piece to fix my ski, because new ski was not available. So growing up, I learned from all those people with whom we went on trips, I learned a variety of skills. From the age of <coughs> seven to the age of 16, when I started going on expeditions on my own, I had opportunity to apprentice and have a lot of mentors who taught me so many valuable skills. And of course, the sewing machine was a part of every household. Like you go to anyone's house, people didn't have a lot of things, but everybody had a sewing machine so you could make they're out of necessity. <clears throat> now, going on these trips, not only we stopped at all the villages, but we also fished and adults hunted and we learned those skills and we've learned to gather all the berries and mushrooms and, and forage and those were really great experiences. The other thing that was great about them that adults tried to plan those trips to stay as far away from the wilderness where there's no people as possible because to make sure there would be enough food in the cultural landscape of the country, in the cultural landscape of so many parts of the country became part of uh, what, 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 I, what I learned as a kid seeing how people lived in the villages. <coughs> so coming to the United States at the age of 22 um, having a uh, two-year-old child that I <coughs> managed to have because of a lack of sex education in the Soviet Union. <coughs> uh, no regrets. Best thing ever happened. <coughs> I, this is the way of life I knew, and I was going to continue that way of life. And uh, as we went on various expeditions along the way, and actually coming here as a political refugee, <coughs> traveling through Europe, I managed to do a long expedition two long expeditions in Europe while other people waited at the refugee camps. We just went out and spent months outside because I already knew how to live without, without money or, <coughs> or things. Just with, like today, I asked the kids, where, which direction is your house? And once you know the cardinal directions, it doesn't matter really where you are. Um, now, this idea people have about being lost, people say, oh my God, I'm in the woods and I'm lost. Well, how could you be lost, really? If you look at it differently. You know you're on the planet Earth, so that's already good. <coughs> and you know more or less what country you're in. That's is getting closer. And then if you know your cardinal directions, you could find your way. Uh, 
So I continued to travel with my, with my child and I started working at Outward Bound and I started guiding and I started teaching at the elementary school. And at first I was fascinated that you could just go to the store and buy everything. I was like, wow, this is amazing. You can go and buy a tent. You don't have to make a tent. You can go and buy shoes. You don't have to sit punching holes in leather mm -hmm. for days on end. <clears throat> But as time went on, I would notice something different that my students who came to Outward Bound, they would come on a trip, they would do a trip, they would leave, and that was it. I wouldn't hear from them again, I wouldn't see them again, this didn't become part of their life, and I realized that that connection that comes with needing to make things by yourself, the preparation, what goes in preparation for the experience, is just as important as experience itself. And actually, experience is very different than if you could just go to an outfitter and rent um, <coughs> your boats and your food pack out is made for you and your boats are set in the river and say, please, go ahead, get in your boats and we'll pick you up on the other end. That's very different <coughs> from uh, getting arriving on the expedition on the train that only stops at the station for 30 seconds and if it stops for 30 seconds you know you have to unload all your stuff for 12 people so before the train stops you start throwing things out the door and then when it starts moving <coughs> you still throwing things out the door and then everybody jumps out and then you go for a couple kilometers and you pick all your stuff up <coughs> and then you and then you figure out how you're going to carry it to the river this is a different this is a different experience so <coughs> as as I started to get an idea <coughs> of cultural differences, I understood that it's important to bring all those rich aspects of what was happening in Russia by necessity. It was important to bring it to outdoor education here in order to make it real. <coughs> and that's how Kroka Expeditions was born. <coughs> now, I have this piece of technology which I was told how to use and Let's see if I could do that. No, that didn't work. It didn't work. Oh, that worked. <coughs> so I will talk to you about Croke Expeditions a little bit <coughs> and then try to relate it to the home family and community because clearly we have to live in a society of people. We are not teaching our students that after they learn comfortable life in the wilderness. They should go in the woods and build a cabin and stay there for the rest of their life. That would be tragedy. If that's what people would do, this would be really tragic. We need young people to make a beautiful world in the society. And we need to go back into the wilderness to find clarity, peace, <coughs> and then come back in the world of people. <coughs> so I'll talk about how we, how we work with translating what's happening in nature to what's happening in society. And in the end, I'll address some of the ways in which we work with adolescents and <clears throat> some of the big questions. And I'll talk about roots of Croca. I already started. And I'll talk about what happens, what we do, <coughs> and how we do it. And this, is, this is the view, view of our campus in Marlow, New Hampshire, uh, in, uh, at the end of September. This is what it looks like when the leaves start, start turning. I already spoke to you about Russian outdoor tradition. <clears throat> the other stream that forms Kroka is Latin American tradition because uh, the half of our organization is in Ecuador. <clears throat> and uh, every year, staff community from Latin America travels to New Hampshire. So we have this exchange. And from traveling in Ecuador over the years, we have learned life in a small in the small agricultural villages. We observe that life, we've learned that life, and every year we bring indigenous people to live with us, and that really informs who we are. <clears throat> now, myself, I have traveled in the Russian far north, in Canadian far north, and then in Latin America. So those are my indigenous connections, and whenever possible, whenever people let me be with them, spending time with people and observing <clears throat> traditions that have not been lost to civilization and bringing them uh, to our work. Now finally, in terms of our theoretical foundations, 
and this is not exclusive, but this, you probably, most of you probably have heard of Rudolf Steiner and Waldorf education <coughs> here. And Pyotr Kropotkin is a Russian scientist who <coughs> is the father of a theory of mutual aid, which is the opposite of Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest, if we put it in the simple, in the simple terms. So <coughs> there's, there's several major pieces of Kroka. <coughs> the, we'll start with adventure sports, and we employ technical adventure sports to give young people opportunity for developing their fitness <coughs> and for developing their willpower and taking healthy risks. <coughs> we firmly believe that uh, all young people, all adolescents, need to take risks. That's very necessary and if the healthy risk is not available they're going to take unhealthy risk because th this is this is just an important part of growing up we can't uh, hold them hostage to our adult fears we gotta let them <coughs> live in the world and so um, clearly with uh, technical adventure sports there there are risks and when there are risks there's opportunity to develop common sense <coughs> and learn your boundaries. You know, the kid, you guys all know this. I, I know you know this. If you as a little kid, you start climbing trees, or you're a little kid, you're less likely to fall off a big tree when you're a big kid and, and, and break your neck. You're a lot less likely to do that. <coughs> um, the second <coughs> part of Croco is wilderness skills, and that is slightly different from a modern theory of uh, leave no trace, which we're all familiar with, which is a wonderful way of thinking about being in nature, but it slightly disconnects people from nature. So uh, uh, our theory about it is that whenever possible, we should use natural materials for cooking with and natural materials for working with. There's a difference if you can make your own spoon, simple, if you can make your spoon and eat with the spoon versus the metal spoon is just a simple small example of course you know in the school you guys are making friction fires and what a joy to make fire by friction and cook your meal on that fire <coughs> and uh, whenever whenever you could find your food in the forest that's that's amazing and of course all of this needs to be done with respect um, <coughs> now what we call connected living has to do with our has to do with our village. <coughs> we have a farm that currently <coughs> grows 35% of all the food that our students eat. We have 1,000 students uh, a year. So before any expedition, all the students work on the farm. So the connections could be made between uh, what does it take to take care of one cow and what does this cow give you back? And, and I see that you're doing all of this uh, here. So I'm really glad, glad to see that. <coughs> We have a draft horse, we have gardens that grow our food in the season and root crops, and we have a big firewood cutting operation. Firewood is maybe not as important here where it's so uh, comfortably warm, but for us it is essential. <coughs> the, our entire campus is fossil fuel free, meaning that we don't have any either propane, natural gas, or oil connected to any of our buildings. We still, we still drive. I, that we have not yet figured out. We haven't figured out a wood-powered vehicle yet. <coughs> um, but what it means is that we need to cut a lot of firewood, which is an amazing educational tool for students because that uh, action of splitting firewood and in, in learning how to do it really well and needing to and needing to split 30 cords of it, I don't know if you guys know cord measurements, 4 by 4 by 8, uh, is, is a great educational tool. It's getting warm. <coughs> Hopefully you're not getting cold because I'm, I'm generating a lot of energy. <coughs> Everything on campus is made by students. If we ever need to build a building, the building is planned and designed in such a way that it's built by students. <coughs> and we make a lot of our equipment. We have a, we have a sewing shop, we have a, uh, <coughs> a woodworking and a small machine shop, so kids are involved in, in making as much equipment for their trips as possible, include, including boats. <coughs> community, I see you have an amazing community here. 
we have certain rituals and celebrations. This word Minga we borrow from the Quichua language from Ecuador. Those are the service work parties. These are the, these are the things that you all know about. <coughs> and finally, integrative acad integrated academics is very much what Manzanita School is doing. So our students who come to us for a semester, they either l earn high school credit or they earn 16 college credits. So our program is uh, uh, offering credit through Sterling College in, in Vermont. <coughs> and then expedition ties together all of those things. So what we really know how to do is an extended wilderness expedition. These are the principles of our expedition. <coughs> so we want to be in the wilderness for as long as possible. And if possible, we want to be off the beaten path. So we'd rather not hike the Appalachian Trail. We'd rather be in places where, <coughs> well, where, there's, where people are not. <coughs> Um, if we're, the longer we are on expeditions, the more layers we can shed. So what happens, in, in, for those of you who are students here, you know, you come to school and everyone is different. Everyone is differently dressed and someone may wear clothes that you wish to have but you don't. <clears throat> and uh, you could wear makeup. You can, there are many, many ways when you go to school to shield yourself from uh, who you may not want to be <coughs> or, or pretend to be somebody else. Now when you go on the expedition, it's an amazing thing. The makeup wears off. After so many days, it wears off. And after so many days, you start smelling like who you are. <coughs> There's no way to help it. And even the order, and if you drag it along, that's not going to help. <coughs> <coughs> and all of a sudden, what you wear doesn't really matter. I mean, what matters is, if, is, your, is your rain gear waterproof. That matters. Is your sweater really warm? But what it looks like really starts matters less. And all of a sudden you see people in a very different light. But it takes time. And there's a different connection that happens in, in that situation. And you have to get through being cold and, and hungry and uncomfortable and hot. You have to get through all these things. And it, and it takes time. And for modern people, for all the people, not just for, ch not just for children and youth, if we were to go and live in nature, if I were to go and live in nature, even though I do it all the time, it still take me some time. Because of course, if you live in a comfortable place, in a warm place, and you sleep in the bed, it will take time to adjust to new environments. So it doesn't make any sense to go on a three-day wilderness expedition. It's a wasted energy. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go on five-day wilderness expeditions either. Because it takes three to five days to just shed the layers and just be, just land and just be there and change the pace of life. <coughs> so that thing about the clarity, the certain, something happens, <coughs> and maybe Isla will talk about it in a minute, something happens after some time of living in nature. And for me it is the value realignment. What's important, it becomes very clear what's really important and what's not. You, you remember that your family is really important, your children are really important, the work with students, seeing the world as a beautiful place, all the noise, so much noise, this just kind of goes away. You come back from expedition a new person, really renewed. Now this English word recreation, after some time when I learned English, I was like, wow, this is an amazing word, recreation. How did they come up with such a great descriptive word? <coughs> Most of our expeditions are point A to B by design because for young people it gives young people a very clear goal. We are 300 miles from a finish line and between now and there there's nothing. We can't get out. We have to get there. That's an important principle of design but you need to allow enough time. If you, if you set up it in such a way that you're moving, moving, moving all the time you're going to miss a lot of things along the way. <coughs> Depending on local sources <coughs> is really important. So going on, a, going on the expedition and bringing food, but not bringing all the food you need, to knowing that you have to fish and you have <coughs> to gather, create certain vulnerability and dependence on nature. Knowing that at the time when you get to point B, you have to hitchhike to get back to your vehicle create certain vulnerability, 
knowing that you don't have all the information you need, that you have to ask along the way, that you have intermittent points where people are, you have to ask those people. You ask for simple things like stop uh, students paddling on Lake Champlain, which has been nicely polluted. So the water, they can't drink water. So they have to knock on people's doors and say, can we fill our water jug? That's a simple example of vulnerability and connecting to people. The important principle is embracing scarcity. So of course, we could bring along lots of things. Now, the backpacking expeditions are nice, or skiing expeditions, because you can only bring as much as you can carry on your back. Paddling expeditions, I was amazed. The first time I went on a Western paddling trip, and I saw what people bring with them in their rafts. <laughs> Is so it like, why are you going on the outdoor trip right now? If you brought your whole house with you, with everything? <coughs> uh, so you just really have to clarify for yourself, why, why, why are you doing this? <coughs> because how do we appreciate, how do we appreciate abundance? <coughs> I remember I was at, uh, I, was, I, I, I went to college here, and one of my professors, we did a project in Russia together. We did <coughs> outdoor educa education project. And he came with me to Russia. We were there working for months. We came back and he said, when I came home, I knelt in front of my door and I kissed the doormat in front of my door and thanked creation for everything I had. I've never done it before. He said, thank you for going on this trip. <coughs> well, that's the kind of thing. Wouldn't it be nice to be always clear and, and always grateful for, for, for what we have? <coughs> It requires certain discipline. It requires creating creating that scarcity. Now, when we have a meal between 15 people and everybody has a bowl, and we serve from the big pot, everybody has a bowl of soup, and at the end we're all a little bit hungry, and we can all eat another bowl or maybe two more, but we're okay. We can go to sleep. It's enough. <laughs> then when we do this for a while and we come out and you come home and your parents put out for you an amazing meal and you say from the bottom of your heart wow thank you so much mom and dad this is amazing i will never take another meal for granted <coughs> so then there is a thing of when uh, when you when your students go on the trip and you know you're a parent and you love your kids and you want for your kid to be to be safe, right? Like that's a natural feeling. You say, are they going to be really cold? Now imagine your kid shivering cold, <clears throat> and the only way for them to get warm is to keep on moving. Or, or they're going to mismanage food. They're going to burn it to death or, <clears throat> or forget the bag somewhere, and they're going to be hungry. You say, I don't want my kid to be hungry. Like, are they going to be starved? Well, you know, this is my kids all, I have four kids. They say, Pop, I'm starving. It's like, no, you're not starving. You don't really know what starving is. And we've never even came close to it. We were on a 40-day we expedition with all the kids on, on, on the Rio Grande. We came to the, <clears throat> and we planned out our food really well. So we came to the last day of the trip. And on that day, we fed the last of food to kids. We arrived in the afternoon, and we had a, arranged. The van was supposed to come. There's no roads, just a through the desert, and it was supposed to be dropped off there for us, <clears throat> and it wasn't there. And we arrived and we had a few crackers and a little bit of cheese left, and we gave it to the youngest that night when we were going to bed. And the oldest kids said, what are we going to eat? And we said, you guys going to eat nothing, because we have nothing to eat. We can, let's go fish, and we didn't catch any fish that night. And so, we went to bed hungry. We were hungry, kids were hungry, and we looked at each other and said, well, tomorrow, if the van doesn't come, it's 30 miles <coughs> to the road, and one of us will start walking, <coughs> and that's okay. And I remember them going to bed, and they were looking at us and saying, Mom and Pop, you really have nothing for us to eat? It's like, we really have nothing to eat, nothing. And this, my son, who is Peter, who is 31 years old right now, 
he just reminded me, we just talked about it, he said, you know, I'm never going to forget this. This was a formative experience in my life. You now that van arrived at 3, at 3 a.m. It arrived, and they were all <laughs> sleeping, and so we went into the van. We got a piece of candy for each other, and we put them under the sleeping bags. In the morning, they woke up, and <clears throat> there was a happy ending to that story. <laughs> So this, uh, so the edge, <coughs> the edge experience is is really important concept that we that we've developed for for teenagers. So like you guys, probably many of you have hiked precipitous mountains where you're walking on the ridge and it's a very thin ridge and you can look both ways and you're kind of walking your way but you know if you take or you walk along the cliffside you take a wrong step and you're gone. If you just, just, I'd like for everybody to imagine, when was in your life such experience? Maybe you've driven in a third world country on a bus <laughs> somewhere. <clears throat> right? This is when you feel like, ooh, <coughs> it's really, really close. I'm alive now, but it's just like, it could be just totally over in any second now, but I'm still here. That's, that's the edge experience. <clears throat> that's an experience that is very important for all the teenagers to, exp to, to live through. Because unless they live through it, unless you guys, teenagers, unless you live through it in a good, healthy way, you're going to push for it in an unhealthy way. So if you don't want your kids to be getting in their cars after they had a drink or two and speeding down the road, down the windy road, as fast as they can, which is not something any one of us would want to happen, or anything else, you need to allow them to have a healthy edge experience. Because we all want to know, humans need to know, where is that line between being alive and not? And we all want to stay alive. We all want to stay on this side. So in terms of outdoor education design, it's a design. How can we do this? How can we walk on this ridge of that mountain, <coughs> knowing that you could fall either to the left or to the right? But what, what is our safety? And mm, that's... That's a question that we ask ourselves. So I'm going to be going to Canada with semester students, and I have your <coughs> Martina, that we're going to be out in on Gaspé Peninsula. It's going to be minus 35 below. So I'm working with this question. The question is, <coughs> it's good. Oh, everything is good. How can we, how can we maintain this so the kids? will be alive on the other end, they'll experience this amazing experience, the amazing expedition, and we can come come through. That's where the guiding experience, that's, that's, that's our work as outdoor educators. People often think, oh, outdoor education is what you do when you go to college, or maybe for a couple of years out of college, when you're figuring out who you're going to be in your life. And it's, it's really tragic. That, that, that's the feeling that people have in the United States, that that's what young people do for some time while they're figuring out how to get a real job. Because it's, it's a very, very specialized professional skill that takes many years to develop to be able to deliver a really good quality program. So I'm glad meeting today with people here that you have people who are committed to this. <coughs> Now, this is something that this is something that happens. The nonverbal communication. Whenever you work live with indigenous people, and some of you probably have, they don't talk a whole lot. <coughs> and you spend time with them, it's like wow, there's like really good communication happening without words. And we have an amazing vocabulary, not so much my vocabulary because it's a second language for me. <coughs> I'm trying. We try very hard to express everything in words, and I think what happened is over time is we tried to try and try to, to explain everything in words. We lost ability to just quietly sit in a circle and understand what's going on, and also listen to the rest of the world's language, because everything is talking, and the trees and the animals and the brook and, and the wind, and there's an amazing language out there, but we need to stop talking in human words. <coughs> Um, Isla, I'll go. <coughs> I'll go back to there. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Isla. Um, I did the Croca winter semester last year, 2017, um, and so it's part of the Croca program. It's five month long expedition. Um, through Vermont and then up into Canada. 
Um, and a lot of that was also, as Misha talked about, preparation. And um, yeah, I got a lot out of the experience of expeditionary learning. And um, a big part of that, it was with 13, altogether there was 13 students, and then we had different instructors throughout the trip. Um, and a really big part of that experience was being with the group and um, planning out and executing and completing an expedition for a group and for yourself and learning re what it really takes um, to have an experience without just having it handed to you, but really taking it and um, going with it and planning it and executing it, as I said. Um, because I, one thing definitely, when I wanted to bring this to Manzanita, it was partially because I felt that um, for our school, it would be really incredible to have that feeling of um, taking on responsibility, but not because you're told to do it, but because it's something that you're seeking and that will give you an experience. And so it's kind of like a necessity, but because it's real life experiences where you're out and you have to get to your camp. So you have to decide and it's like a decision whether you stop there because it's late and you make camp or you go to where you were planning on going. And um, it's also a way that pe you can communicate with the group. Um, and I really learned a lot about listening to others um, and making decisions that aren't that have to be made because of necessity. Um, and so that's partially why I wanted to bring expeditionary learning after Croca to Manzanita community. Um, and yeah, so just kind of that feeling of being with the community. And we started to do that in the high school now with our expeditions, but having a job that you're responsible for and knowing that um, you have to do it well, not just for yourself, but for the group and for the good of what your expedition can be. And like Misha said, finding that edge and pushing through it um, and really knowing that you can do something that you didn't necessarily know you could, which was a big thing for me because I, there was a lot of moments where I was really, before I even went, I wasn't sure about my strength in a lot of areas. I was a really bad skier at first. Um, but pushing through and knowing that you really have to push through because um, for the good of yourself and for the group and for the expedition, it's not just something that's that's handed to you or that is expected from others, but it's expected for yourself to, to make sure you can do it. So that was really what I took away from my Croca experience on the semester. Thank you. Yeah, and the, and the young people are amazing. Uh, they are working with, I, I quite don't understand it because a lot of times adults say teenagers are hard to, to work with and they are, uh, but I, I don't find that at all. I think teenagers are like amazing people because they're so full of enthusiasm and uh, op total optimism and <coughs> uh, certainly feed, um, feed us with this, those important qualities. Yeah, Isla did not know how to ski at all. Uh, <laughs> and she, she, had to, she had to learn in a hurry. <coughs> I remember the first lesson we had, then everybody got in their skis, and I said, we're going to meet up there on top of the hill. <laughs> I'll see you guys there. And, and we start a lesson, and I count heads, and I see Isla still at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> OK, she'll, she'll figure it out. She did. She became one of the best skiers in the group. <coughs> So knowing that, knowing that many of you are parents, I wanted to talk about how do we bring this, how do we bring this home? <coughs> and it also, I want to talk about as a parent. Uh, my kids are, my kids are of different ages. They're <coughs> 14, 18, 25, and 31. It's been the, they've been my most important teachers. I've learned from them more than I've learned from going to school <coughs> or or teaching, because they're they're the ones. They're the ones that really challenge me to be my to be my best, <coughs> um, and ask me that question: How do we make sense out of a life on the expedition? How do we apply it to our life at home? So I'll talk about home and how to design nature-connected, inconvenient home, 
in some of the family habits. And having this, in, and I'm realizing like where I am because I didn't quite understand where I would be. I thought more about like LA as a big city, but I see how many of you guys live here. Like this, I don't think it would be anything new, I'm going to tell you, <coughs> but I'll, I'll go quick. <coughs> Well, this, by the way, this is an example of a house that's built on campus of Croca by students as part of the integrated mathematics curriculum. So this is a kind of a typical project of what, of what we would do. <coughs> so this is just a good review, right? A review of what makes a convenient home. All Americans know this, what, what, what makes a convenient home. <coughs> I don't even think I need to go through that. <laughs> we'll just skip that. What, this is the inconvenient home. <clears throat> so the inconvenient home is really important for raising healthy kids. It's a place where you have to work for things to happen. Now we are, this is where our cold climate works really well for us because I always said people people ask me what is the most important thing you know about parenting and I say it's a wood stove mm -hmm. it's the most important thing I know about parenting because for us the way our house is designed is a wood stove is the only thing in the house that keeps it warm and cooks food and so kids have to split wood stack wood split king kindling and collect birch bark in the woods and they have to do it all the time and they get to a place where it, you don't have to talk to them about it because they want to eat and they want to be warm. So all you have to do is you have to have discipline not to do it yourself. You have to discipline to say, all right, you, by the time you leave home to go to school, you need to leave at 7.30. You know, if you leave at 7.30, what time would you like your breakfast? Uh, you like your breakfast at 7. Excellent. Then at 6 o'clock, you need to start the wood stove. I will cook your breakfast when the stove is warm. <clears throat> it requires discipline to be able to say something like this to your teenager who is going to say, rah, rah, why don't we live like normal people live? <clears throat> <laughs> the, one of the things over time that we figured out about our house is that if we make, and we're fortunate, we live in the underpopulated part of the world and we've been able to build over the years two houses. <coughs> so an experiment with different designs. So we built our house in a way that all the rooms are purposefully so small that you don't want any to do anything in your room because mm -hmm. your in your room your room is more like a cubby. It has a kind of a ceiling where you can't quite stand up. <laughs> And it has a bed, and that's all that there is there. <clears throat> and there's just one open space. And so then all the homework will be done right where dinner preparation is happening, and right where everything is happening. And that, do kids love it? No, they don't. They're going to be like, oh, I can't focus on my work. I need my own space. <laughs> Figure it out. Like you need to figure out how to live in community. Like in the world of the future, you're not going to have your own space. Just look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. In the world of the future, you're going to be with a lot of other people in one small cramped space. Learn it right now. <clears throat> and also, when we're all together, right? when I'm cutting my vegetables <coughs> for dinner and kids are doing their homework, they're going to ask me a question that would, they would ask Google otherwise. Right? It's a communication. <coughs> Now, of course, this is a uh, the, this is the big this is the big question about home as a sanctuary. So, of course, kids are going to tell you. Maybe this kids wouldn't, but <clears throat> most kids would say we need internet in order to do our homework. Now, some of these concepts may be a little bit far fetched for some people, but so this is how we came up with the compromise. Because if we don't have internet at home, kids cannot do their homework because their homework at school is connected to the internet. So then they're going to stay at school later, go to friends' houses. We want kids at home. So we came up with a little device that needs to be plugged in <coughs> 700 feet away from the house. You have to go through the snow, <coughs> get an extension cord and plug that in. <laughs> and then before you go to bed, you have to go back there, unplug it so it wouldn't freeze. <coughs> 
and bring it in. That is working really well because it's being used when needed and never otherwise. <coughs> Uh, we, we've been working with that a lot with people. I, like you guys are living so close to the center of that, but but there are many different ways to think about this. And but it's fairly clear to me that this constant connectivity is not a good thing. And then the home is a place where there's where there's sanctuary from information flow rather than increased information flow. Because what we want at home at night. I don't want to have everybody sitting with their laptop at the dinner table doing their work. It's all very important and good, but I'd rather we play game of cards or we, or we, or we play music and sing together or we talk to one another. <coughs> um, so those are, those are very hard questions of today that everyone needs to think about in their, in their own way. And what I encourage you to think about the boundaries. So I just want to ask you a question. How, I'd love to hear from you. How do you, people address that in, in your homes? Does anybody have any limits on information flow? Well, we have a small house, about 800 square feet, two little bedrooms. We have a large room where we spend all our time. And we've tried several times to say, this room, there's no technology in this room. And it's worked for little windows of time where, you know, if you want to check something on the phone or the computer, you got to go in another room to do it. But it's, um, everybody breaks it, rule, and then eventually there's no rule anymore. And then I, I've tried a few times to reactivate it. But um, that's just um, something I've, we've tried with modest success. I know, is that right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I upset her friends because her friends come over. And sometimes friends come over and they're just like, much more so than my daughters. They're like, it's, it's I, I don't even know what to say. A sister friend I hadn't seen in years from England came, brought his 13 year old daughter. They were with us for three days, and it never left her hand, and her face never left the screen. She was 13. I don't think I ever had a conversation with her or looked at her. It was amazing and scary. <laughs> Anybody else? Please. Um, well, first of all, in this part of the canyon, there is no reception. There's no phone reception, so unless they have your Wi-Fi login, they don't have any connection. So that usually prohibits or prevents visitors from being on their phone unless you give them the login. Um, for us, uh, Friday night is Shabbat, and that's always just no <coughs> electronics. When the kids were little, we read, so Friday night is a no electronic time. And uh, in general, I think it's really difficult nowadays to, to live in town and to restrict it, especially when you have, I have also four kids and one is 21 and the other one's 12 and how do you navigate one being on, the other one not being on and it's just, I struggle with it, to be honest. But the rule is definitely during any meal times, absolutely no electronics anywhere near the table. That I'm, even when we go out for dinner, I don't want my kids to sit at the table. I, I tell them it's rude towards me. It's like, you're here with me, we have conversations off the machines. So they know that part, but you know, it's definitely a struggle. Anybody else have any other, any other insights? This, uh, this is a challenge of our time. Just as a slight offshoot of that, I was gonna take families out to the wild. And be before we go, the parents come to me and they go, we're a bit worried about the kids. We're not quite sure how they're gonna handle the no connection thing. The kids are fine. It's the parents that really yeah. struggle. So let's not just see this as a kid's problem because a lot of adults are seriously addicted. Yeah. Just to add to that, it, you know, given our kids the choice, we say, would you like to play a board game or cards? Every time it would be their choice to connect. They love to play games. They love to connect with us. And it's, you know, again, taking responsibility as a parent to get off the computer at night and stop doing the work and to do the effort because the kids, I mean, I know, they would rather connect every time. Um, you know, our house is, sounds about the same size as yours, actually. So two small rooms and one kind of room where we, it's connected to the kitchen. And our son is 13, our daughter's 10. He doesn't have his own phone. He's one of the few kids his age that doesn't, and he has some time on my device. But it's, you know, it's a real thing where I kind of feel, gosh, he needs to be able to connect to his friends in between. But you see, as soon as he has it, it's 
I mean, something happens. It's immediate. You see, I mean, it's crazy how quickly. Thank you. Uh, I, I think there is some good news in this uh, realm that there are, I just read an article yesterday about several of the kind of top Facebook and Google people who are talking about uh, how do we go forward? We haven't had any real thought about how our gadgets are impacting young people. And I think now there's some people who are really starting to talk about it at, at um, high levels in technology about how do we manage um, a principled approach to the dissemination of these gadgets and technologies so that people can ha have deeper connections. So I think that there, there are movements like that. And so I, one of the things that the Nature Connection does is it offers a solution. It offers an, an option to that. So um, I, I think bridging those two things, as John Young says, strengthening the cords between those two movements might be a, uh, a really beautiful way forward. Beautiful. So this is a great way for us to move forward now. Uh, this is just one of the things. Let's not turn the whole thing into technology. Uh, this is great. Um, so these are some of the examples of what are simple illustrations. So how uh, the choices that you could make. You could, uh, uh, you could allow your dishwasher to break. Which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so next time it breaks, don't fix it. You could choose to, you know, especially in your climate, and you guys probably already have it, right? The dryer is absolutely unnecessary because all of those things, they create work. Work is really important to be connected to life. You know, in, in, in the search for conveniences, we've disconnected ourselves from flow of, of living, from what does it mean to be human. Like doing dishes is great. It's not a waste of time. What are you going to do if you don't do the dishes? You're going to search the internet? We just talked about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a few of other examples. There's thermostat versus the wood stove, or car wash for, or versus the whole family washing the car. It's just a little little illustrations. <laughs> uh, illustrations are connected. You, know, you, could, uh, you could choose to cook a meal from scratch. That will take a long time. Everybody needs to get into chopping vegetables. I'm sure you all do that. You know, we, with four kids reaching the driving age, we figured that one of the wonderful family community things is not to have enough cars. We deliberately have a lot less cars than their people because then cooperation is necessary. You have to design your life that encourages people to work together and cooperate. So, of course, here you guys have it. I just already see this. Driving around here, so this is an even unnecessary, unnecessary slide. But uh, creating usable, creating usable outdoor spaces that are actually used is, is really important. Thank you guys for coming. But one of the best things that we figured out at home is the distance, a long distance to cars. Not building a driveway to the house, but parking cars by the road and, and having a walking trail. There is no way to drive to the house, so everything has to be cared, super inconvenient. Kids are like, why do you have to drive it to the house? Why do you have to carry all the groceries? You know that, yet? It's good. They eventually figure it out. <laughs> so then there, there are family habits that, that families have. Uh, like always having dinner together, having special special holidays, holiday rituals. And in our family, we have a wilderness vacation ritual. We've taken our kids all out of school every single year for the past 20 years. And we go, we take a month off, we figure out no matter what, regardless of circumstances. And we've taken our kids on a month long wilderness trip and, and they reach the point where they're not sure if they want to go. And then when they grow up, they say, thank you, it was like the best thing that we've ever done as a, as a family. I think that that's what kept us together through all the struggles of life, <coughs> doing those wilderness trips. Um, sibling community, if you have multiple children, and, and I'm really fortunate to have children that are spaced out. They really rely on, another, on one another. So here comes the college application process. I'm not going to 
read your essay. Your older brother is going to help you with your college essay. That, that, kind, of, that kind of thing. Who is going to teach you how to drive? Your older brother is going to teach you how to drive. That's, that's a real big asset. I know we can't afford to have four kids per family anymore. I'm sorry for my part in that. But uh, <laughs> it, it does help. Grandparents, you know, figuring out life. Where, you know, this is this is different. Remember, I came from Russia. There was no question. And your great, you lived with your your grandparents lived with you. There was no other options. There was no <coughs> moving moving to California or <coughs> even nursing home. That was not an option. The option was you to carry elders. It was annoying sometimes. But now looking at this, it's really mean. So you know, the fact that my 80 year old mother spends half of each week with us and the kids are greatly annoyed with her sometimes saying oh our clothes stinks like fish babushka is cooking russian fish again it's terrible i can't go to school like that kind of thing <laughs> so now i will just talk a little bit of how we view going from a family to the wider community. So there's some little, some little examples of what, of, of what we do at Croc and how we work with our students. So this daily encounter mindset, I'm sure this is not new for all of you, it, it's an opportunity. Right? It's an, every time we meet somebody at the grocery store or somebody in daily life, we have opportunity to walk by them or we can have an encounter. An encounter means that we look them in the eye and we ask them, How's your day going today? And learn and meeting that human being. That's that's an amazing little exercise that we could that we could do. <clears throat> I love doing this today. Coming here, we gave a ride to a really nice man. Um, <clears throat> so this engaging children and meeting the needs of others <clears throat> is not so simple in a society that is so so focused on individual family units, but really important. Yeah, the kids, kids may or may not complain about it. You know, when you say, today we're going to shovel our snow. We're lucky to have lots of snow shoveling. That's a good, that's a good thing. And now we're going to go and shovel neighbor's snow. Why are we going to shovel the snow? They're not going to pay it. No, they're not going to pay it. We're just going to go and do it. We're going to go sand. It's icy today. Let's go Sunday. Let's go sand down neighbor's uphill driveway. That kind of thing. So this is one way, I know it's very controversial in this culture because people say this is dangerous. I don't know why people say this, there's probably a reason. I have not encountered in 30 years of living here. It hasn't been dangerous for me yet, but it has been an amazing educational tool for raising my kids. Because every time I stop and I pick up that person who may smell like alcohol or like marijuana or just smell really bad because they slept out in the woods, and every time we drive on the way to school with them and they tell their story because that is an education that is my children are seeing that not everyone is as privileged as we are and we ask them questions where did you sleep? I sleep in the woods I have my tent set up in the woods that's where I live and I go hitchhike to town every day and I beg for money on the street and it's not on the television and it's not in the book it's in their life that is really important now, this is a this is something that <coughs> we figured, and it's was, it's really clear. Yesterday, I arrived into Los Angeles and coming here, but people don't always practice this. So we can people oftentimes <laughs> think of think of driving as kind of like a race, like thinking about their own needs. But if we change the mindset and think about other drivers, it's a, it's an exercise because everyone drives here. I think it's a useful exercise for everybody. So you just think of others all the time. It's, a, it's just an exercise. How do you drive? Now, this is an amazing exercise that would really, really help get all of us to go in places instead of using navigation to write down directions on a piece of paper. And then it's a game. It's a game of orienteering. Because you're driving and it's like, okay, 100 feet, I'm going to turn right. Oh, there's a detour. What do I do now? Now I have to stop because I don't know where I'm going anymore. And I have to ask somebody. Oh, they don't speak English. So now I'm going to ask somebody else. Now all of a sudden I'm learning about neighborhood and I'm meeting people. Now this is a really interesting ritual 
the roadkill ritual that we've developed with our children. <coughs> that when we see a roadkill, when never possible, it's not possible all the time, you stop, you take the animal off the road, and you bring them in the woods and you say goodbye to them. You put them in a place where they belong. <coughs> and in doing this, you acknowledge <coughs> the life. And you, and you see, you don't have to talk about it, you just do it. Something changes in how kids you know. I have to say that my kids are not fast drivers. They're actually slow drivers. They drive slow. I haven't talked to them about it. They just somehow do it on their own. <coughs> and I'll finish with talking about some of the principles that we use in working with our adolescents. <coughs> I'll talk about some of the leverage points that we work with at Crocker. I'll talk about altruistic will, and then how we view some of the big questions with which we work in, in our work at Crocker. <coughs> so that's, this would be an example of what we would, how we would work with our staff with our young staff in training staff how to work with adolescents. And so we have a lot of adolescents in the room. You guys may or may not agree with me. <laughs> this is really important for safety, the clear boundaries. Right? And, that's, and that is why kids that is why kids push us. They push us because they want to know where is the safety. And if you allow yourself to be pushed and there's no safety and, and then there's no boundaries then it's very hard. It's very hard to grow up. It's really good to know. Kids ask this of us all the time. So they're going to ask this of me right now. They're going to say, if you talk to us to, to, tonight, to me, about not using navigation, are you going to drive out of here and you're going to use navigation? Or are you going to write directions on a piece of paper? That is super important. No. Whenever we, we are so well informed as a society, we are so well informed, we know so many facts about so many things, and it's really not necessary for, I don't find that this is so necessary for adolescents to always work with facts, because it's better to work with ideas, and it's really important to strive for ideal, and it's important for us too. So oftentimes, we get returns into this, realistic conversation, they say something really beautiful, say, well, it can't happen, it can't happen, you don't understand, we encourage idealism. <coughs> no, no, when I come home from work, and my, and my kids say, oh, it's a hard day in school, school sucks. <coughs> I'm sure that students who go to school here probably don't say that, I hope they don't. <laughs> uh, school sucks, too much homework. <coughs> So what do I say? I say, you know, I had a really awesome day at work. I just loved it. It was such an awesome day. And, <laughs> and they say, Pup, why are you home so late? Why did you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning again? I say, I woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning because I love my work. I, do you have to get up? No, I don't have to. I want to. <laughs> but we'll, talk about, we'll talk about big questions and addressing those questions in a minute. Just, with kids, and this is really important. I find myself as a father oftentimes shying away from the conflict with my boys because I'm afraid of the conflict. It's not a comfortable place. And I, and I realize that it's, it's really important. No, there's no way. Conflict present in nature. And if we're going to model what happens in nature, in nature there's, there's storm and there's crushing of trees and there's floods in the brooks, there's conflict. They, you, 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 teenagers, teenagers like wild nature. There will be a conflict, and we need to, and we need to deal with it. And then, this is about this incremental progress. So, I came here yesterday, and yesterday was Sunday, and on Friday night, my 18-year-old son came home from school. <coughs> And he just had a concussion because he went off the big ski jump on his cross-country skis and landed on his head on the ice and he's behind on his mask. He's in the regular school, three tests behind. And the teacher said, he's going to fail math. And I said, you're going to Boston to see your uncle. 
who's going to work with you on Saturday and Sunday on math. And he said, I'm not going to Boston because this weekend, since I can't race, he said, Nordic racer, I'm going to spend this weekend with my friends. That's my plan. And I'm 18 years old. You can't tell me what to do. So I'm going to spend this weekend with my friends. I could, I hate math. I hate pre-calculus. I do not spend my weekend working on my math. And so we said, well, you're going to go and work with your uncle on math because we love you and you know how long it took you to work on your college application. And your colleges are waiting for your grades. You know that you know that you really want to be with your friends. And you, now you could kick and scream and you could tell us how much you hate us. We're ready to hear this. But because we love you, this is what you need to do right now. And we don't expect you to even think that it's important. Because there's no way you're gonna connect. This is not important for you. And so he went to Boston and he studied math. And then he called and said <coughs> Pop, I was already in the airport, and he said, Pop, the Patriots game is Sunday night. The Patriots game, right, Sunday night? Can I stay? So now we're talking about this trade-off. Can I stay tonight and watch Patriots game with my cousin? And then I will drive to school tomorrow morning. Now that's three hours, because we're far away from Boston. So now I'm thinking, okay. It's about incremental progress. It's about give and take. It's crazy for me to say you can stay there and watch Patriots game, but that's what I'm going to do. Because he gave, he accepted that, now I need to accept his part. And that's back and forth. And that felt good. So, all these challenging things that we talked about, like knowing when you turn off your technology at home, or, or turning off the thermostat and bringing in a wood stove, all these things, they require will. I already talked about how that will force that used to be part of everyone's growing up, where you had to do lots of things, and you had to walk to school for many miles, etc., etc., and those of you of previous generations probably had to do more than your kids have to do, that's phenomenal, right? And you kids now, you have to figure out how your kids will have to do more than you have to do right now. Otherwise, we go in the wrong direction. <clears throat> so we got to the place where we need the development of the will need to be part of education. <clears throat> and we have this idea of altruistic will. Because <clears throat> humans have will, of course. Because if you look at everything we create, all the huge roads and bridges, enormous shopping malls, enormous developments, everything we do, oil pipelines, we have a lot of will. That's a very egotistical will. That's a different, that's a will to do things for your own fulfillment. This is a will to do put needs of others before your own. So we define it as compassion and willpower. And these are some of the examples of practical ways that we develop this. So we develop compassion if we're caring for other peoples and animals. That's why we have farm, full of farm animals that are working for us and feeding us. <coughs> and kids, students are involved in harvesting 100 chickens or harvesting two cows. Students are involved in that and that's, they develop compassion in doing that. <coughs> Volunteer service, living with people with special needs. So when we accepting students to our semester, and students come to us and they have severe special needs, we want to accept them, together with students who are A-plus, honor, great students, and have them together in one class. <clears throat> we already talked about experiencing suffering of others, not, not shielding kids from those experiences, but thrusting them in the midst of it. And then institutional habits of, of cooperation and putting needs of others first. And I, I already seen in the school that the school cares for putting in place those kind of those kinds of habits. So then these are examples of how we develop will. That's going right back to some ways going back to our tradition. So we know that teenagers want to go to bed late and get up late. And there's plenty of research out there that's saying that teenagers do better, they need to go to bed late, they want to stay up late, and sleep in. So if you want to develop a will, you do the opposite of that. You, sit, you go to bed early and you get up early. 
So, so when you jump off the cliff into the water, but that's a clear example of a physical challenge. There's also an emotional challenge. When, you, when in the morning you wake up on a camping trip and you need to run into the ocean and jump in for your morning bath and it's really cold, that's delivered scum. When you're sitting around in a circle and you need to talk about someone carrying a lightweight pack while you are struggling with a heavy pack and you need to voice it, you need, that's, that's an emotional discomfort. But in order for Martina to go on an expedition right now, back in New Hampshire, she is every day, she's working really hard, exercising hard, and skiing, and she has her goals, and she's going through it day after day, and she knows she has three more weeks to get to a certain place. That's <coughs> developing her will, developing physical stamina. Now when we're going to get on the, on the trail, and all the students put on their packs, and we start skiing, and someone falls behind, and everybody has to stand and wait for them to catch up. That takes a lot of will, waiting for the last person in the group. <clears throat> and then, this is really important. So, and that's the principle we use in our academic work, the high standard for finished work. I brought some examples of student work there in the corner. So this is a quality over quantity of work. That, it's really important. And for us, it's really important, I'm sure you guys do that too, to do handwork. How about you write a beautiful essay and you write a 2,000 word written essay written by hand. People, modern time people say, you're crazy. Why do waste time writing by hand? But when the pen touches paper, you develop a new will force. Especially if you write it beautifully. <coughs> So I will finish by talking about that in education, we believe we need to address the biggest questions of our time. That's the purpose of education. There are lots of those questions in front of us. So I just used, here's a simple, three simple questions that we work with our students right now. <clears throat> so we're living in the midst of a rapid climate change. How do we embrace climate change? <clears throat> So we're not shying away from it, so we're not denying it, and we're not lamenting it, and we're not complaining about it. So we said, okay, we used to always have snow. It used to be beautiful. We skied all winter long, and we'll go skiing on this day, and maybe on this day, and now we say, well, we don't have snow all the time. We have snow only half of the time. So every day we have snow, we're going to go skiing. And at the end of the winter, we have skied more times than we've done before when we have good winters. This is just a small example of working with this question. No, we know that this is a huge question. And we say, we really need to look at this. We really need to face the reality. It's, it's very simple. There's so many people in the world. Children understand that they're very smart. They understand this is how many people. And we have drying out planet. Well, you guys are living in the part of the planet that's drying out. Right? The people are going to go from places of scarcity to places of abundance. You can see the nature all the time. That's a natural process. You can't prevent it by building walls, by having immigration policy. That's not going to work. Eventually, this is going to break down. So this is the educational concept that we need to work with right now. How do you embrace this? How are we going to embrace sharing our abundant resources with a lot more people? <coughs> and, of course, after you spend six months living out in nature, without even any adults talking to you about it, or without reading books, you see that there is no profit out there. That, and the growth rate is not 10%. That the forest grows really slow. And you think, well, if we were to sustain life on Earth in a long time, we need to start looking at how things happen in nature. And you start deconstructing things that we take for granted and we cannot imagine living without. And that's what the principles of our education program. That's the end of my talk and I'd love to hear any questions you guys may have. for having such a thoughtful way of teaching young people. It isn't just intuition 
but I know there's a lot of that. I know you came with a lot of life experience that said, I've got to do this. And I'm just great, really grateful and thank you for thinking and reflecting and the best as you can giving words and phrases and ideas behind what's unfolding because that really helps us as educators to say, oh, I can do that and that and that makes sense and that fits our paradigm. And I think that's part of our responsibility is to take our idealism if we're speakers and, and teachers and offer it in words. So thank you. I just want to thank you for that. It's really helpful. <laughs> I actually have a question for Isla, if that's all right. Um, what, did, did you have an edge experience? And uh, if so, would you care to share it, if that's all right? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I had a few edge experiences, I would say. Um, one that comes to mind, um, I've shared this before, but when we were whitewater paddling, I'd never white been in a canoe in whitewater before, and I was kind of scared of it before we actually even were going to go. Um, and I was, it was, we kind of switched partners each day, um, and I actually preferred to be in the stern, which is the person who's steering. Um, and I was with another student, and we both weren't super confident white water paddlers, and it was a really long day. We were paddling for, I don't, I don't know how long, but it was a long day. And there was a few sections of white water, um, and I was really nervous to start off that day because I felt like I wasn't very, I wasn't gonna be able to, um, especially the white water I was afraid that my steering wouldn't be good enough or um, that we wouldn't really get it done but we ended up um, once we hit the white water was pretty scary and the person in front the person in the bow she wasn't confident and she needed me to tell her what to do and so it was an edge experience for me partially because the white water in general scared me but then also because I had to step into leadership that I wasn't um, that I wouldn't have otherwise because I was I preferred being with someone better than me so that I could fall back on just comfort of knowing someone else is in charge but she really needed me to tell her what needed to be done so it was a um, the chance from and it was it's all happening really fast because you're in white water and you're gonna hit a rock or things like that so um, that was an edge experience both um, for my leadership and for just the experience of going through white water, and we didn't flip, which was nice. Um, so that was one edge experience. And we always wait. So this is why this expedition is our return trip home from the northern borders. So we have to wait for the ice to break on the rivers, and as soon as the ice breaks, we follow the ice. So mm. the stakes are really high because if you flip, <laughs> you gotta get out of the water really fast. <laughs> you have very little time. Yeah. Mm. Great. Um, now I just want to say last thing that I'm here with Leah. Leah over there, if you haven't met Leah Landon. <coughs> and Leah is a long-term Croca staff. She came to Croca as a, really soon after college, right? And Leah is our new Croco West coordinator because Leah settled on the West Coast. And Leah came to us and said, I love Croca, but I am living in California. Can you have Croca in California? And we said yes, after, after a, lot of, uh, a lot of thought. So there is going to be Croca in California with a, with a base at uh, Fry Ranch in uh, Yeah, uh, and uh, Leah is a full-time employee developing developing programming here in California. So for the moment, there's going to be programs for schools, and we've been working with many California schools over the years, and they fly to the East Coast, and we're going to encourage them to stay home. <laughs> and eventually, there will be summer programs too. And it's a, it's a real honor being here, seeing what has been done here, and it's so encouraging. 
to come across the country and see such a beautiful initiative and families coming together to, to make a big change for this uh, fortunate young people. Thank you so much for taking your time. Good night.